Chapter Five of Dead Love Has No Chains by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five. Conrad Harling's cure was as complete as it had been rapid. He was like a creature newborn. His physical powers had been garnered in the house of bondage. Extreme care had been taken of his health during those years when the mind was frozen. Proper exercise had been insisted upon. Slouching habits had been prevented every means that modern science could devise to keep the bodily machine in splendid working order had been employed if this unhappy young man was to have only an automatic existence that life should be the best of its kind his doctors were profoundly interested in him as a remarkable case a man whose mind had been killed by one sudden grief a passionate young heart which had loved with such fiery ardour that the ruin of his love had been the ruin of his mind no one at roehampton had believed in his chances of recovery and his cure made him doubly interesting as a case the head physician discussed the situation gravely with lady mary she had kept no particular of her son's foolish passion from him she had told him all that she had learnt in a long interview with meadows and his spinster sister he has a very fine brain the doctor told her and all the best qualities of manhood pluck resolution presence of mind energy perseverance i have observed him carefully since he has been practically a sane man and i have the highest admiration for his character a preux chevalier as every youngster of good birth and fortune who has never known the seamy side of life ought to be but he has a highly emotional temperament you'll wonder how i find that out perhaps seeing what a passionless thing life is in this place well i'll tell you his dog that brown setter he's so fond of was ill the vet thought she was going to die i saw despair in your son's face yes a grief that was almost despair my tender-hearted boy you will have to be very careful of him an unhappy love affair in the morning of life made a wreck of him you must do all you can to guard against a second shipwreck he will go back to the world still in the flower of his strength handsome attractive a magnetic young man he will inevitably fall in love again and if his love is a happy one his future will be secure marriage will be his safest harbour with a wife he loves he will escape the dangers of imagination and temperament oh i hope he will make a happy marriage i know more than one sweet girl who would be a sweet wife and then lady mary's brow clouded with anxious thought you do not think it would be wrong for him to marry she asked no no there is nothing in this case to forbid marriage nothing in his history his mental upset was an accident but we are going to make very sure that his recovery is complete before he goes back to the world if you and he are to winter abroad i should advise some quiet place out of the beaten track where he may have time to take up the dropped threads of existence and to accustom himself to contact with strangers where strangers are few i have no fear for him he is a splendid fellow and if half a year hence you find his mental health established would it be necessary to tell the secret of those sad years to the girl he might want to marry or to her people the doctor reflected gravely i think you might ignore that history without compunction this opinion relieved lady mary's mind she felt she had not lied in vain she had all the summer in which to consider her winter abode conrad stayed at roehampton with an interval of three weeks at a seacoast village in devonshire untrodden by the tourist where he went with his mother and the house doctor who had become his particular friend the doctor wanted a holiday and he went as the young man's comrade rather than his medical adviser here mary harling had the delight of seeing her son in the plenitude of mental and bodily health rejoicing in his strength like a young giant spending long days sailing a ten-ton yacht or tramping over the hills with the doctor making friends with the fishermen and coastguards interested in every living creature and in every aspect of nature as he had been in his early boyhood when all the world was new it was the miracle of a mind recreated a mind that revelled in a world whose beauty had been forgotten in that long slumber of the brain and where every common spectacle of nature seemed a thing of wonder the purple of those heather-clad hills the ineffable glory of those sunsets on the edge of the western sea the flowers in cottage gardens the gold hair and blue eyes of peasant children the rugged beauty of tawny visaged fishermen splendid in their rough strength the earth and every common sight filled this new mind with joy and then there was that other world the new world of books 
poetry fiction history science were all taken up with a fierce rapture science most of all enchanted him he threw himself with ardour into the study of scientific progress of the secrets the universe had yielded up while he sat aloof as if in barbarossa's cavern and knew not the march of time he surprised his mother one day by some casual speech that showed he knew exactly how long he had stayed in the house of bondage he told her afterwards that he had found her last letter in one of his coats that had been sent from oxford the pockets of all his clothes had been emptied but this letter had slipped under a slit in the lining of a morning coat when memory revived the date of this letter which had been kept in his desk gave him the date of his captivity seven years he had been seven years without sense or knowledge he was now seven-and-twenty in appearance younger than his age for in that long sleep of the mind the lines that thought writes even on young faces had made no mark upon him he had an almost boyish air and outlook frank joyous alert eager he had all the characteristics that make youth enchanting he would have but to appear in order to conquer his mother thought admiring and adoring him what girl could resist such a lover oh that he might choose wisely that his manhood might be won by beauty and virtue after the lad's fatal infatuation for worthless charms his mother trembled when she thought of the second ordeal a passion that might in spite of all his gifts prove unfortunate the doctor advised that he should not go to cranford till he had spent some time among unfamiliar surroundings it was well also if there were anything in his manner any slight deviation from common ways which might hint at the secret of his long seclusion that there should be time for the strangeness to wear off before he went among his own people his mother told him the story she had invented to account for his disappearance he laughed and praised her for her tactfulness our friends may question you perhaps she said about my travels let them interrogate to their hearts content i will not leave a square mile of central africa unexplored from the congo to zanzibar there shall not be an acre that i can't talk about i will familiarize myself with every squall that ruffles the tanganyika with every treacherous current on the nyanza there are books and maps enough to give me every light and shadow over every mile of african travel i shan't quail before the keenest explorer i may run against all i want is to know where i am supposed to have been this was after he had been at liberty for half a year and when he and his mother were going back to england and to hertford street they had spent the winter and early spring at a delicious villa among hills covered with olive woods between spezia and lerici they had been alone together with only a christmas visit from the young doctor conrad's friend at roehampton daisy meredith had been given a long holiday with her own people whom lady mary paid handsomely for the entertainment of their daughter a detail that was scrupulously hidden from daisy herself who wondered at a certain deference to her tastes and wishes hitherto unknown in the home circle it was not till the blackthorns were in blossom in cranford park that conrad went back to the house where he was born the home that he had left full of buoyant life seven years before going back to oxford in the trinity term and it was in that trinity term in the freshness of the early summer that his fate had found him swift as the arrows of phoebus apollo a lad's first love had stricken him with its consuming fever that wild unreasoning love the first strong impulse of the passionate heart had exalted a common coquette into a goddess dazzled by a faultless face blind to all that should have warned and repelled him the impassioned boy gave up heart and mind to his enchantress friendly undergraduates hinted things and even after youth's careless fashion tried to save him but he had taken fire at the slightest word she was peerless she was perfect earth held no girl who could compare with her what did her surroundings matter he would take her away from that vulgar world she was fit to be an emperor's wife and it would be sweet humility in her to accept him who had nothing to offer but his money thus and thus had he argued in that romantic dream which had enthralled him a dream of a brief summer term and a summer vacation which seemed an eternity of joy and pain blotting out every memory of the years that had gone before he thought he had not lived till he met her in those placid restful days among the italian hills the book of memory had opened itself and conrad had spent many an hour wandering alone and dreaming over the passionate story that had cost him nearly eight years of his life that was the price of an unreasoning love 
eight years perhaps the best years of a young man's life the miracle was that he had not killed himself in his despairing rage when he found how worthless a creature he had worshipped it might be that only madness the sudden extinction of thought and memory had saved him from suicide he looked back and went step by step through the old dream with a calm mind the love was dead as babylon or nineveh a heap of ashes a monument of folly to meditate upon with self-contempt in the earlier days of his recovery the girl's face came back to him out of the clouds her beauty shone like a star then little by little as memory strengthened he lived again through every detail and circumstance of his love story and following that story stage by stage he saw what an abject fool passion had made of him he remembered moments of jealous doubt sudden suspicions lulled to rest by a smile hard questions answered with a caress he recalled his aching sense of the chaperon's vulgarity his torture of jealousy when he saw other admirers favoured other undergraduates young and attractive he remembered the figure of the pugilist loafing in the inn garden or drinking in the bar or rowing or playing cricket a cheap alcides with a certain picturesque beauty of strength and graceful movement and he remembered that never for one instant had he thought of this man as a possible rival the folly the commonness of it all sickened him he did not even want to know what had become of her the goddess of a single summer he wanted not to know never to hear her name again never to see any one or anything that could remind him of her happily there was no question of his going back to oxford to work for his degree his trustees had kept his name upon the college books but his mother would not even speak of the place people at cranford neighbours servants hangers-on were delighted at his reappearance among them he was so handsome and looked so young whatever dark suspicions had been harboured by friends or dependents as the years went by and he was still absent were made not by his return no trace of past suffering shadowed the glory of his manhood he was the ideal youth taking pleasure in all the things that youth ought to love daisy beheld him with wonder when she came back to cranford she had seen him in hertford street in that agonizing interval before his banishment to roehampton she had seen him a wreck she alone was in the secret of his lost years for even the servants had been taught to believe that his disordered brain was a passing trouble the natural symptom of a fever and that he had recovered and had gone to africa with a friend only daisy knew the truth and daisy's kind heart overflowed with gladness at finding him completely restored she was glad for his mother's sake indeed it was impossible not to rejoice in lady mary's joy joy that made her step light as a girl's her laughter gay as a child's her hands eager to scatter benefits on the poor and needy they spent more than a month at cranford before going to london for the season and lady mary entertained all her rural neighbours the people who had been mystified by her son's absence who had speculated about him and had lamented over him and pitied his mother at many a rural tea-table and who beholding her young absalom in his strength and beauty felt that they had wasted their pity after all i suppose he was only roaming about the world said the squire's wife young men nowadays have such a rage for exploring he had better have stayed at home and taken the hounds said the squire it would have been more to his credit than globe-trotting but you'll allow that travelling opens the mind urged a spinster aunt don't talk nonsense juliana do you suppose a young man can learn anything from kaffirs or south sea islanders but the great book of nature to see that unfolded sighed juliana wouldn't he see enough of nature in a day with the hounds do you think there's more education in an african swamp than in a field of turnips or a forty-acre pasture i have no patience with the rage for wasting english money on ox-wagons and black porters while english farmers have to give up breeding hunters because they can't sell em the hunting was all over before conrad and his mother came home but he rode every day exploring every bit of country within riding distance of cranford he insisted on teaching daisy to ride she having come back somewhat pallid and wan from the arid wilderness of north london and the domestic bickerings why had she not ridden in all these years with a stud of hunters eating their heads off lady mary blushed at the question which struck her as a reproach she had thought a governess cart and a sturdy pony good enough for daisy a cart in which to drive herself about among the scattered homesteads and cottages carrying charitable gifts or kindly messages visiting the sick 
and making herself beloved by young and old since she was not of the strong-minded order even when she saw things that were amiss her word of reproof in due season was as mild as other people's blessings and now lady mary felt that a young woman of daisy's fine health and figure ought to have been allowed to take some more pleasure out of the horses than feeding them with sugar or apples on a morning visit to the stables the horses had been there growing stale and elderly for eight years and no one but the corn-dealer and the grooms had profited by their existence i didn't know that she would care about riding said lady mary she was such a thorough cockney before she came to me she would adore it i asked her yesterday when she was petting mayflower the old mare don't you know clever as a cat and quiet as a sheep she flushed up like a child you get her a habit and mayflower and i will soon teach her to ride the habit was procured from a southampton tailor in less than a week while mayflower was being broken to the side saddle and daisy was soon scouring the country by her cousin's side you women have all got light hands conrad said you've only to learn how to use em and you sit your horse uncommonly well for a beginner and you've a neat figure and a wild rose complexion that doesn't turn scarlet after a gallop he continued within himself he did not want to flatter the young lady she was a kind of cousin and he treated her in a brotherly way that was charming he carried her off for a ride nearly every morning forgetting that she was his mother's companion and ought to be winding silks for the landscape on the embroidery frame the mill-stream and poplars that lady mary had been engaged upon in her cabin when she talked to jane brown he found a second horse for her and he showed himself so wise in his selection that no harm ever came to her from either mount he made her play croquet with him and here she was the adept and could give him bisques for which humiliation he revenged himself in the evening at billiards it was a humdrum kind of existence but just the existence that was best for him in the opinion of the roehampton doctors lady mary began to take alarm was he falling in love with daisy meredith daisy who was charming as a dependent and protege but who was utterly inadequate for the proud position of conrad harling's wife except that she was a good and pure woman she would be almost as objectionable as the innkeeper's daughter for the blood of lady mary's ducal race had been filtered through more than one plebeian family before the union of daisy's parents and those parents were in themselves particularly objectionable a husband and wife who quarrelled and parted once a year who were always impecunious and always trying some new device for earning money the man in the city the woman in the suburbs singing mistress lady milliner lady cook beauty doctor there was no limit to the potentialities of discredit or even of disgrace lady mary would hardly have been surprised to read of mrs meredith's debut at a music-hall for the unfortunate woman had a fine contralto voice which daisy had inherited she was surprised to discover the girl so much prettier than she had ever thought her hitherto perhaps it was the influence of youth conrad's buoyant temper the rides the games the long days in sun and wind that had given such lucid beauty to the large grey eyes such a brightness of rose and lily to the fair young face daisy was six-and-twenty and had talked of herself as passe and had so considered herself for some time yet every year she saw beauties reigning triumphantly in their seventh or eighth season growing only of more imperious and world-renowned charms as the years went by like peaches slowly ripening on a southern wall where every hour of sunshine deepens the crimson and amber of their bloom lady mary began to think that daisy was pretty enough to be dangerous and then she was the first english girl conrad had met in his new life there lay the peril she was certainly the prettiest girl in that part of the world but although daisy as a typical young woman was charming daisy's people made her impossible remembering the doctor's grave counsel lady mary told herself that however impossible a girl might be from her point of view if conrad set his heart upon marrying her he must not be opposed in his desire indeed his mother must be thankful that his choice had fallen on a virtuous woman he must not be thwarted he must not be disappointed the passionate heart that had suffered so cruel an agony of lad's love must not suffer from the nobler love of manhood he must not be opposed but he might be managed lady mary announced her intention of going to london directly after the whitsuntide holidays london will be at its best she said conrad owned frankly that he preferred the country but he expressed himself pleased to go wherever his mother liked i know you love mayfair better than the most romantic spot on earth ma'am 
he said smiling at her he always addressed her as ma'am in their lighter moods mother was a word for confidences and quiet talk when they were alone i was born there lady mary answered simply that was a solecism you ought to have been born at one of the ducal seats a town-house wasn't worthy of my stately mother i think you must have been stately even as a child you wore your sash with an air and crushed the nursery footman if he forgot to bring your bread and milk on a salver they were settled in hertford street early in june when west end london was certainly at its best a glorified city full of people whose only business was pleasure full of blossoming trees and brilliant flower-beds and exquisite frocks and hats and beautiful faces full of fashions that caught the eye from their novelty just queer enough to be called chic and that would be hackneyed and stale at brixton before the end of the summer lady mary opened her house as it had never been opened since mr harling's death her hospitalities were bounded only by the limits of time and opportunity she gave two dinners a week and had people at luncheon every day but all her little entertainments were part of one deep laid scheme to bring the most eligible girl she could find into her son's company until some day the girl of girls would be found among those eligible ones and conrad would marry to the delight of his heart and the increase of his social distinction so much in lady mary's world depended on a young man's choice of a wife whether he should be double his weight in the social scale or have it to marry daisy would be to have it there were at least ten girls in lady mary's visiting book who were eligible and of these six were beauties while three were great heiresses and one was the daughter of a famous politician whose prestige and influence would assure a young man's success in the parliamentary arena lady mary watched the effect produced by each of these gifted ten and although she saw her son pleased to find himself sitting next to a lovely face or a vivacious companion or a girl who could talk politics with ease and discretion she could perceive no sign of his being seriously impressed she returned to the charge day after day following up a luncheon and the charm of a huge picture hat with a dinner and the attraction of parian shoulders and rounded arms and all this beauty left conrad cold he talked he danced he even flirted mildly with lady mary's eligibles but he showed no preferences a pretty girl was a pretty girl and no more he had no more romantic ideas about them than peter bell had about a primrose by the river's brim the better they waltzed or the better they could talk the better he liked them and his mother observed with regret that it was the girls who had done their four or five seasons whose society conrad most affected their vivacity and keen criticism of life amused and interested him everything interested him it was a mind new-born the life of the mind was new science literature art music facts fancies superstitions follies all things were new at eight-and-twenty years of age he was still in the flower of his youth strong as a lion and he had the freshness of a lad of twenty just escaped from a public school in the country his horses and dogs had been enough for amusement in london the novel pleasure of rushing through the air on the last and finest development of the motor science took his fancy and he had not been in hertford street ten days before he had established his garage and become owner of a panhard and a mercedes he spent his money with royal magnificence and on finding that his mother's income could not afford more than occasional stalls at the opera he hurried off to bond street and wrote a cheque for a box on the grand tier now ma'am you need have no more trouble about your seats on the wagner nights he said you will be as much at home at covent garden as in your own drawing-room and i shall drop in every night when it isn't wagner his love of music was not the educated love the old operas pleased him best the operas with stories that he could understand and melodies that haunted him lucretia borgia rigoletto traviata faust and his first favourite don giovanni he had the gaiety of heart which charms invitations poured in upon him manoeuvring mothers courted him he was handsome he was rich and of unblemished character since his mother's intense pride in him was a warranty for his good conduct during those years of travel he had not spent too much money he had not been troublesome he was quite the most popular young man of his season lady mary rejoiced in his gladness with a swelling heart rejoiced with wonder she had feared that the shadow of those blank years the memory however dim of that long captivity would never leave him 
that through all his after life the thought of what he had been would be a recurring pain and that he would never be quite as other men of his age and now she knew that he was superior to other men that the long slumber of his faculties had made him a stronger man on his awakening it did not even pain him to speak of the past or of things that touched upon the past he showed his mother a photograph of stella meadows in an evening frock with a liberal display of shoulders and arms her girl who has no opportunities of wearing evening dress likes to be photographed in it lady mary owned that the girl was beautiful absolutely refined in feature and expression it was difficult to think of her as a rustic innkeeper's daughter still more difficult to think of her as the mistress of a pugilist but at oxford lady mary had heard something about the girl's mother and a scandal attaching to the girl's birth which suggested a more aristocratic origin a patrician lover a deceived husband while she looked at the photograph lady mary had a vague memory of another face of the same delicate type though not actually resembling this face she tried to remember when and where she had seen it and worried her brain for half a day in the effort to remember when suddenly as she sat in her victoria stopping by the park rails to talk to her friends the scene in her cabin on the electra came back to her and the face of jane brown it is not the face of a pure woman thought lady mary wondering at this resemblance of character and expression rather than form the vague something which made one face suggest the other jane brown had not written as she had asked her to say that things had gone well with her lady mary had almost counted on such a letter as a natural expression of gratitude for kindness experienced in a day of misery but it might be that things had not gone well the wretched girl might not have survived her hour of trial might not have lived to clasp a child to her heart and to devote herself to a life of atonement and self-sacrifice as mary harling who took a severe view of the situation had hoped she might in her motherly kindness she had imagined a future of grey peace perhaps with a husband some humble-minded christian willing to take a penitent to his heart and cherish her with a sober affection as a brand saved from the burning but no word had come and lady mary inclined to think that jane brown was lying in the last long sleep in some neglected churchyard in a lonely parish hidden away in the south of ireland where the long roll of the atlantic breakers would lament over the short sin-stained life lady mary had little time to think of jane brown in this joyous midsummer with her son's animated presence bursting in upon her matronly occupations at all hours of the day he adored his mother and was never in the house long without giving her a taste of his company over and above the social hours of eating and drinking together those cheerful gatherings in a handsome dining-room which must surely be regretted as a memory of something that was pleasant when the chemists of the future have found out a way of sustaining healthy and vigorous life on tabloids conrad's high spirits were a continual feast and a continual surprise to his mother from the hour when he heard her manner of accounting for his absence he had treated his african travels as a stupendous joke that his mother the severely truthful could lie for him was to his mind an astounding instance of maternal love and to him the african fable was an inexhaustible source of amusement so far from shirking any allusion to his travels he led people on to question him and he was never tired of reciting his adventures in that wonderful world he had collected every book of travels that had appeared since livingstone first kindled the british mind with enthusiasm for african adventure he had read himself into africa and there was no detail of the life no thrilling moment of discovery no vivid impression of the picturesque in land or water mountain or forest no colour of earth or sky that he had not absorbed and made part and parcel of his own mind with stanley with cameron with burton with trivier he had wandered and wondered he plagiarized freely but from so wide a variety of writers that he was not afraid of being found out not even when almost in cameron's very words he thrilled a luncheon party by his impressions at first sight of the tanganyika or when with stanley he plunged into the blue waters of the zambezi for his morning bath and found himself tumbling about among a herd of hippopotami adventures with native kings adventures in dug-out canoes on tempest-tossed lakes adventures with elephants lions antelopes hair-breadth escapes of every kind he had them all at the service of his friends and was admired as the most vivid of colorists the most graphic of narrators his mother and daisy meredith heard and marvelled and sometimes ventured a grave reproof which he laughed away 
the initial lie having been told there can be no harm in expatiating upon it he said and remember daisy all my adventures are true absolutely and matter-of-factly true although they didn't happen to me but i shall have to make them really true some day for i think i have caught the african fever and then your conscience will be lightened of a burden and you and my mother can sleep easy in your beds lady mary exclaimed and remonstrated could she ever know a night's rest if he were a traveller on that dark continent where when two go together only one returns End of chapter five chapter six of dead love has chains by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six daisy's life narrowed to strictly domestic limits in hertford street she had left her habit at cranford with the hunters and shooting dogs all things belonging to the life that she and conrad had led together in frankest friendship almost as brother and sister he had brought a couple of hacks to london and he rode in the row before breakfast but lady mary had set her face rigidly against park riding for daisy meredith i let you have your own way about her in hampshire she told her son but i don't want you to go on spoiling her now we are in london where i really can't do without her conrad gave way without a struggle and his mother assured herself that he was not in love a lover would not have been so reasonable he told daisy that she should ride to hounds in october and whenever there were ladies on his motor she was one of the party there was no desertion of his rural comrade conrad was always kind after his paternal fashion but he was tremendously in request and had very little time to spare he went to dances that daisy did not hear of choice balls in great houses where from five and twenty to fifty of the fine fleur of young manhood were entertained at a sumptuous dinner in order that they might condescend to dance daisy thought herself lucky if she went to three balls in a season chaperoned by one of lady mary's good-natured friends she used to awake in the warm summer night hearing carriage wheels rolling up and down the narrow street and picturing to herself the brilliant scene in park lane or stanhope street or berkeley square or grosvenor or belgravia and picturing conrad harling as the grandest handsomest most utterly delightful young man there it was after one of the biggest balls of the year when the summer and the season were at the zenith that conrad expressed himself more enthusiastically than usual it was the finest ball he had ever seen i suppose the flowers were something wonderful suggested daisy fairyland a week's food for an east end parish squandered on lilies and roses walls of roses pyramids of lilies words cannot paint the splendour and the supper inquired lady mary gunter cum gargantua an endless web of peaches and asparagus and ortolans and quails young turkeys stuffed with truffles ham stewed in champagne everything expensive that a greedy man could imagine i took a turn in the green park when i came away and saw the tramps lying asleep in the pale green light with open mouths and faces the colour of death lady mary sighed and daisy sighed to them as to conrad the contrast was dreadful everybody feels the same sharp pang and forgets all about it three minutes afterwards and the people inquired daisy were all the pretty people there all married and single and one over who was that the new beauty it seems i ought to have heard of her though she only came to london a week ago after all the drawing-rooms were over she was supposed to have been presented in dublin last winter a dowager told me as if it mattered when where ever or never she looks as if she had dropped from a star too ethereal for earth did you dance with her daisy asked with a throb of heart pain two waltzes she waltzes divinely i felt like a cyclops embracing a sylph you haven't told us who she is said lady mary with whom the who was more essential than the what oh she is quite quite don't you know an only daughter with a young stepmother her father is sir michael thelliston the general who distinguished himself by his management of that little gold coast scrimmage the other day or at least made people believe it of him is she an only daughter an only child the stepmother is a gushing person and told me all about her husband and all about irene that's her name 
and she looks it i want you to call upon lady thelliston ma'am at your earliest convenience this afternoon if you like lady mary smiled at him across the cosy round table they breakfasted in the library a room with an old-fashioned bow window opening into a morsel of garden which was full of flowers that were brought there in their beauty and taken away directly they had done blooming like young beauties in a sultan's seraglio lady mary smiled and told herself that the spark had been found the young heart had taken fire this new beauty had only to appear and to conquer where her garden of girls had been impotent to charm is miss thelliston much prettier than all the other pretty girls you know she asked prettier oh i don't know how to measure prettiness she is almost too exquisite to be mortal like those marvellous orchids that seem too beautiful to be only flowers you talk as romeo talked of juliet do i what would i not have given for juliet's balcony last night to have had a long jaw with her after the ball well i'll call upon lady thelliston since i suppose they are newcomers quite new mere babes in a wood from a society point of view he has been fighting all his life in india egypt africa always doing well according to the wife but never coming to the front as he did in the west african row call this afternoon ma'am if you please i should like to know what you think of the stepmother do you know where they live yes in a slip of a house in chapel street with a front that looks like a ladder of flower boxes how did you come to know the house she rides every morning in point of fact i rode with her this morning i walked my horse that way and saw her mount she has an arab that her father brought from india for his wife who had been married before by the way to another soldier and the wife doesn't like the horse in point of fact can't ride and so her stepdaughter has the reversion of him and she told you all this in two waltzes exclaimed daisy the stepmother told me miss thelliston is not loquacious does the young lady ride alone no her father rides with her but he was under the weather this morning and she had only her groom she was dancing at three o'clock and in the row before eight she is not one of your rest cure girls who lie in bed reading french novels till it's time to dress for lunch i hope there are no such girls said lady mary with whom getting up early was a part of religion conrad could scarcely be more eager about his mother's visit to lady thelliston than she herself was to become acquainted with the girl who had attracted her son the history of conrad's future life must needs be coloured by the woman he loved and married that he should choose wisely now in the flower of manhood he who had so unwisely chosen in his early youth was of infinite importance she had been told that he must not be thwarted in a second love affair that to keep the balance of that fine mind now perfectly adjusted there must be no new love trouble he had loved with an intensity of passion rare in early youth a concentration of purpose that indicated unusual strength of will and unusual sensitiveness to cross his will now to come between him and the desire of his heart might be fatal his doctors had signified as much and his mother thought of this sudden fancy with a thrill of fear he had talked of the new beauty with boyish lightness too openly perhaps for real feeling but a fancy begun so lightly might grow into passion and oh what a lifetime of joy or sorrow might have begun among the roses and lilies of last night's ball romeo's tragedy of swift sudden love began at such a festival among the lights and music in the joyous crowd mary harling felt that her peaceful days were over she was on the threshold of a passionate drama the drama of her son's destiny was the girl a lady that is the first question a woman of lady mary's milieu asks sir michael thelliston's daughter was at least of decent birth and must have been decently brought up but lady mary had met with girls of superior lineage and expensive education who were not ladies those were of course the exceptions that prove the rule but what if this girl were an abnormal specimen and not a lady conrad had declared that she was quite quite and after all that he had suffered for the sad mistake of his boyhood he was surely of all men the least likely to be captivated by the loveliest girl in london if she were bad style bad style was lady mary's bete noire she went about the world with a suspicious eye finding it in unexpected places that girl on the steamer for instance with a hideous phrase don't give me away in the midst of her tragedy 
she had not forgotten her shudder of disgust even in a moment of pity that girl was undoubtedly bad style and all that had happened to her in cashmere had been more or less the result of bad style a chaperon with neither morals nor manners a lover who was not a gentleman the kind of life lady mary had read about in anglo-indian stories slang was interwoven with conrad's speech but slang had to be forgiven in a man like smoking and sporting papers and motors and bulldogs but a slangy phrase from a woman's lips was intolerable lady mary went alone to pay her visit she often took daisy with her on such pioneering calls when she had been asked to be civil to some friend of her friends but this was too solemn an occasion she wanted to be alone to have all her senses about her she wanted to weigh the girl and the stepmother in her judicial balance which she could hardly do if daisy and the girl were keeping up a trivial chatter at her elbow she went early in the afternoon wishing to be the only visitor she looked up disapprovingly at the tall narrow house the ladder of flower boxes scenting bad style in that flamboyant facade there were too many flowers and the effect was garish yet lady mary liked colour and would have admired the joyous dazzle of tropelium and lobelia pink geranium and sulphur marguerites on any other facade she went into the house with a sinking heart it had come too soon the manhood's love which she feared the love that must be satisfied in the narrow entrance hall and on the narrower staircase everything was gay and pretty the white woodwork the white wallpaper over which gigantic pink roses clustered and clambered the moss-green velvet pile that covered every inch of the stairs and landing in the drawing-room where the visitor found herself alone there was the same gay colour it was the house of a petite maîtresse a house like a bonbonniere and it seemed almost too diminutive to be a real house after the spaciousness of the old family mansion in hertford street where all lady mary's audacities in the way of colour had failed to give an air of gaiety this box of a house on the sunny side of the street sparkled and glowed like a bed of summer roses the stepmother appeared before the visitor's eager eyes had time to disentangle the elements of prettiness china water colours miniatures bonbon boxes hot-house flowers scent bottles fans how more than sweet of you to come so soon lady thelliston exclaimed with outstretched welcoming hand mr harling told us he would ask you to call but we thought even if you were so good as to come it might be ages first i like to know all my son's friends lady mary said in a quiet voice he he so much enjoyed his dance with miss thelliston he says she waltzes divinely even in saying these few words she had time to discover that the stepmother had been remarkably handsome and that her complexion came out of bottles as a work of art she was faultless hair figure hands eyebrows but mary harling shivered at the thought of her as conrad's mother-in-law isn't she wonderful buried alive in an out-of-the-way corner of the south of ireland ever since she began to grow up and yet the most delicious dancer and more accomplished in every way than one girl in a hundred is sir michael thelliston an irishman intensely irish though i'm happy to say a long life in india has only left him a suspicion of their dreadful accent and miss thelliston was educated at home in her father's house questioned lady mary wanting to find out everything about these people but painfully reminded of previous visits in strange drawing-rooms to inquire about the character of an upper servant my poor michael has no irish home he sold every acre ages ago when he saw things were going from bad to worse our sweet irene has been vegetating under the care of a spinster aunt roman catholic and a bigot at that lady mary was dumb she had been seized with an inward trembling which made her look forlornly at the nearest gold and crystal scent bottle wondering whether it held eau de cologne or any other reviving essence it was not her father's fault that she was not having a good time in india the climate was her only enemy he sent her to cashmere but even that divine climate didn't suit her so there was nothing to be done but send her home it was before our marriage and the poor man had no one to advise or help him and then came the west coast war and his regiment left india a month after our wedding day hard lines for me wasn't it lady mary murmured something with dry lips and lady thelliston always charmed to talk of herself went on blandly but it was all for the best 
and the little african war did more for michael than burma or waziristan and he got his k c b just in time after a long hard-working career and very few chances i came home to find a house and furnish it and get everything ready for my dear old man and the first thing i made him do for me when he came from africa was to take me to ireland to see my new daughter again a murmur from dry lips a despairing look in a face that seemed frozen lady thelliston admiring her own coiffure in a narrow panel of looking-glass meandered on complacently what a revelation i expected a clumsy overgrown potato-fed girl with a thick brogue and no manners and i found a gem of the first water a girl pretty enough to make what people call the match of the season i thought of tom moore's lovely song full many a gem of purest ray don't you know and i insisted on bringing her to london with us she has only been here three weeks and she can hardly walk in the park in peace people stare atrociously and i saw women standing on chairs to look at her last sunday the women who come on char from brixton enfin my stepdaughter is talked about everywhere as the new beauty is she pleased with her success lady mary asked finding a voice at last a voice that sounded not her own if she is she doesn't show it she's rather a curious girl if she were not so lovely i should call her strong-minded added lady thelliston as if the union of mind and beauty were impossible the door was opened quietly and the new beauty appeared tall and slender with loosely coiled hair that held the sunlight and dark eyes that were like deep waters she was the girl mary harding expected to see but glorified the troubled countenance the sullenness of despair the slovenly garments had obscured much of that delicate beauty and there had been the indefinable suggestion of a lost woman that had shocked and pained even a heart inclined to pity to-day she looked as pure as a june lily her simple white frock perfection her coiffure admirable her pose graceful and dignified mr harling did not forget his promise said the stepmother smiling at her lady mary this is my daughter irene who greatly enjoyed her dances with mr harling it is so seldom one's partners are as good as mr harling the girl said quietly while lady mary looked at her in silence the girl's calm outlook and steady accents took her breath away that she could stand before her there smiling unabashed with the air of a young princess accustomed to adulation disgusted the woman who had been kind to her in her day of shame she did not consider that there had been time for irene thelliston to prepare her mind for this encounter to muster all that she had of courage or of audacity to face the situation nor did she reckon with the defiant attitude of a girl who had lately discovered that she was eminently beautiful and had the world at her feet what an actress thought lady mary and she was thankful for the loquacity of the stepmother who expatiated upon last night's ball the pretty people who were there the harridans and horrors who ought not to have been there the ortolans and peaches the scraggy shoulders and painted faces the band the rose-wreathed staircase and the royal guests she gave a cover to lady mary's silence and enabled her to make her escape with a somewhat hasty adieu while lady thelliston rang the bell the girl followed the visitor to the landing as if by an instinct of politeness but directly they were outside the mask dropped and something of the old trouble came into the dark eyes and trembled on the lips but the girl spoke no word she only looked at lady mary very earnestly and made the sign of the cross an instant before the butler appeared to conduct the guest to the door where the unexceptionable footman and the unexceptional victoria waited the visit had not lasted a quarter of an hour but mary harding went out into the sunshine dazed her mind paralyzed home she told the servant as she sank into her seat and footman and coachman wondered home was all she wanted she was not equal even to driving round the park she wanted to shut herself in her own room her bedroom where nobody but her maid would come and to think out the situation he must not marry her he must not marry her the words repeated themselves in her brain like the strokes of a hammer and then came that other thought he must not be thwarted there was the horror of it and then there was her oath the only vow that she had ever made upon that sacred symbol in her well-ordered life there had been no need of oaths no secrets to keep 
until her son's breakdown obliged silence she remembered how the girl had pushed the crucifix into her reluctant hand and how her lips had rested on the sacred form could that distracted girl bowed to the dust by her disgrace ashamed and angry with the fate that had put shame upon her could that crouching figure those eyes hiding from the light be one and the same as the dazzling vision of to-day so pure-looking and ethereal the oath bound her she could give her son no word of warning for what manner of warning would serve if it were less than a revelation of the girl's history what other obstacle could be put in the way of ardent love unless she could tell him that the girl he admired was a fallen creature she could not hope to influence him she could only hope what most people hope in the face of a threatened misfortune that the danger would blow over this sudden fervour this impetuous fancy for a lovely face might pass and leave no permanent impression was it not quote, too rash too unadvised too sudden too like the lightning which doth cease to be ere one can say it lightens End quote. she tried to believe that her son's ardour indicated a caprice and not a passion but if it were otherwise if he were to fall seriously in love with irene thelliston well she had weapons even if tied on one hand by her oath and on the other by her dread of opposing her son's will she would fight for her beloved it should be war to the death between her and this audacious girl who could presume to meet her with a placid smile pure and innocent-looking as mary when she listened to the divine messenger she wondered if in every crowded ballroom in every throng of girlish faces there were secrets as foul as this i must fight for my son she said to herself and then began to meditate upon the weapons she could use could she carry him to the other end of the world with her pretend an ardent desire to visit the antipodes and persuade him to take her there he was so kind so indulgent to all her wishes that if he were fancy-free it would be the easiest thing to make him forego all the pleasures of an english winter the hunting and shooting that his soul longed for and take upon himself the toil and burden of a journey round the world to do her pleasure but if he were no longer fancy-free if his heart were touched to propose such an exile would be to ensure a refusal he would see through the manoeuvre and resent the attempt to part him from his enchantress no it was to the enchantress herself she must appeal even if she had to sue in forma pauperis urging the inferiority of such a marriage for the new beauty the girl who was expected to make the great match of the season could very well afford to refuse a commoner with thirty thousand a year she would appeal to miss thelliston's vanity to her ambition to her great greed of wealth or remembering her impressions on board the electra and believing that there was some good in the creature whose remorse for sin had been so keen an agony she would take a higher ground as a mother pleading for her son she would appeal to the girl's better feelings you have all the world before you to choose she might say let this man go what can it matter to you End of chapter six chapter seven of dead love has chains by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven having resolved upon the thing that she must do lady mary was able to compose her spirits and to appear in the drawing-room at a quarter past eight with the usual placid and reposeful air she dined at half-past eight in summer so as to allow conrad one more half-hour of sunshine and open air or perhaps a rubber in the card-room at arthur's daisy was always dressed early and she liked to amuse herself at the piano till lady mary came down it was her idle half-hour after the last letter had been written daisy's chief duties lying in the epistolary line there was daylight still at half-past eight and only the reading lamps on the tables had been lighted amber shaded lamps that made for prettiness in the large lofty rooms with their gilded louis seize furniture and turquoise blue hangings there were some fine pictures of the decorative order a leighton a pointer a frank dixie two classical subjects by albert moore a dog and a girl by Britton riviere and an alma tadema that sparkled like a gem pictures chosen years before when mr harling refurnished his father's house for his young wife the room had a large splendour utterly unlike the petite maitresse air that lady mary had objected to in the chapel street drawing-room 
there were books on all the tables and there was lady mary's embroidery frame under a silken cover but the costly frivolities that crowd modern tables and make them useless as tables were not there the only ornaments were a few pieces of sevres in a pair of old french boule and ormolu cabinets if punctuality is the politeness of princes it is also the homage of sons and conrad's usual way was to be in the drawing-room at least ten minutes before dinner was announced it was the moment in which he told his mother the news of the day who was alive and who was dead among illustrious invalids who was in and who was out in the by-election what horse had won or which side was beaten at lord's although these latter results neither troubled nor excited her she liked to hear of them from him and would even affect an interest in racing and cricket this evening he only appeared two minutes before the butler bright-eyed and flushed fastening the last button of his waistcoat as he came into the room why weren't you in the park this evening ma'am he asked gaily i looked for your victoria in the usual spot and ever so many people asked me why you weren't there the finest afternoon this summer i thought you were going to windsor on your motor as you arranged with captain selkirk on wednesday i let selkirk go alone with his wife they were only married in february and they would rather have a long tete-a-tete than my company and were you all the afternoon in the park daisy asked i was there in the golden hour when the river of life is at the flood when the bobbies are clearing the road for the queen and when there's not a chair to be had for love or money he gave her his arm and they went downstairs lady mary following in a stately solitude even in that one flight of stairs she had time to ask herself why she had ever been so demented as to object to daisy as a wife for her son why she had not encouraged his liking for the poor cousin and done all in her power to keep him in the country where daisy was a bright particular star among the rather plain daughters of the squires and squireens and of the one great nobleman whose four overgrown girls nobody had been induced to bid for how well adapted they were for each other daisy just tall enough for good style her neat shining head a little above conrad's shoulder not insolently overtopping him everything about daisy was satisfactory her manners her clothes the songs she sang her way of thinking everything indeed it was only natural that lady mary should approve of a girl who was the work of her own hands all the refinements of daisy's education all the things that had formed her taste and improved her mind travel books nice people had come to her from lady mary she had gone to hertford street a raw girl with one shabby box and a flavour of bohemia in her manner and she was now in mary harling's opinion a perfect specimen of gentle blood and gentle rearing she was good style lady mary had done for her what nature did for wordsworth's lucy she had made her a lady of her own and conrad had been in a fair way to love this girl he had been perhaps on the threshold of a grande passion for daisy meredith when his mother nipped the delicate flower in the bud and brought him to london to fall into the toils of jane brown there was less talk than usual at dinner daisy was thoughtful even to sadness conrad played the agreeable rattle while the fish was being eaten and fell into preoccupied silence during the rest of the meal but not till he had questioned his mother anxiously about her health i can't understand your staying at home in such delicious weather ma'am unless you were feeling not quite up to the mark a chill a headache or something no i was quite well but one may tire even of the park it's rather like a superior kind of treadmill compared with a rush on a motor said daisy never mind daisy you shall have a motor rush before long we'll make up a cosy little party and go to henley to tea the selkirks and you and perhaps sir michael and miss thelliston and my mother might run down by rail and meet us wouldn't that be rather jolly daisy in a voice of inexpressible sadness replied that it would be too delightful for words the butler handed wines of which one glass was taken by conrad and fruit which nobody could look at i thought they'd never go said conrad when the second pair of black silk stockings had vanished behind the noiselessly closed door then turning to his mother eagerly well you saw them both ma'am you went early like a brick and found them at home come now what do you think of them how about first impressions his manner was gay but daisy could see that he was nervous apprehensive of he knew not what eager impatient i think lady thelliston is a very meretricious person 
patronizes the beauty doctors, supplements nature with art. Well, she must have been remarkably handsome dans le temps, so there's some excuse. There is no excuse for a lady rouging her cheeks like a person in the Burlington Arcade. This, for Lady Mary, was equivalent to a torrent of bad language from another woman. Conrad looked surprised, and then laughed. Oh, my dear mother, how old-fashioned you are! rouging her cheeks as if modern art stopped at such primitive measures do you think when middle age comes upon an attractive woman she has only to buy herself a pot of rouge and a hare's foot she must have beauty specialists massage electricity and give her complexion at least two hours a day of serious toil it's a mercy if she doesn't resort to surgery and have her face flayed and get yourself a new complexion at least that's what my partners tell me about their aunts but let us pass lady thelliston and tell me what you think of her stepdaughter i saw her only a few minutes she is very handsome i have no doubt you speak with such an uncertain tone but your own eyes beheld her you must have seen that she is lovely did you ask them to lunch or to dinner they go out a great deal but i hope they could give you a day a verbal invitation in a ten minutes call my dear conrad that's hardly my way of inviting people you do not seem to have been very effusive i did what you wished me to do you called upon them like the vicar's wife on a new parishioner but i want you to make them your friends to bring them here i want daisy to be kind to irene who is a stranger in london she won't be long a stranger if everybody is raving about her like you said daisy when can you ask them to dinner mother get them to name an early date it can fit in with one of your innumerable dinners the season is half over so there is no time to lose have you seen sir michael thelliston not yet he doesn't show up at dances i shall meet him in the row to-morrow morning he's all right a hero a diplomat a k c b write one of your little dainty notes to-night ma'am so that lady thelliston may get it at breakfast to-morrow there was no help for lady mary conrad fidgeted about the drawing-room till he had her seated at her davenport writing the invitation i am giving her a choice of two days next week and three days the week after thank you ma'am i think she'll choose the earliest even if she throws over something good she wants to have you for a friend i don't think we can have an idea in common said lady mary oh but you can tell her about people teach her how to steer her bark a newcomer an anglo-indian what a privilege for such an one to know lady mary harling his tone was a caress he hung over his mother's chair delighted at seeing the letter addressed and sealed he rang for the servant to get it posted at once thomas and at the post office you are going to ride with them to-morrow morning asked lady mary to-morrow and always till they give me the cold shoulder the general rides every day it was only a chance that she was alone this morning she rode on the north side of the park to avoid the crowd and you were with her all the time she would have found it difficult to shake me off he was not ashamed of his infatuation it was young love eager headstrong determined romeo's love for juliet after his heart had bled for rosaline a second love ardent as the first and perhaps no less fatal to love like that suddenly unquestioning was to strike the key note of a tragedy lady mary was in a desperate pass she could not openly oppose him by refusing to be friendly with these people she must diplomatize and still hope that the sudden fire would burn out quickly like a candle in a draught wasting itself in a profligate flame with her son she must diplomatize but with the sin-stained girl who had bewitched him she could deal plainly and speak straight words her invitation was accepted promptly for one of the earlier days with a sinking heart she made up her party a literary man and a soldier the soldier young and attractive would make the seventh and eighth of a friendly little dinner conrad was glad that they would be so few and his mother hoped that her nephew who was in the scots greys and a general favourite might prove a counter-attraction for miss thelliston and perhaps develop that young lady's least winning characteristics if for instance she were to show herself an incorrigible flirt and so disgust conrad in the dawn of love lady mary's policy was machiavellian and merciless 
she felt that her cause was good and fought without compunction the dinner was bright and gay and lady mary's manoeuvre was unsuccessful miss thelliston's behaviour was perfect while she was amiable to both young men she was familiar with neither and she showed herself deeply interested in daisy and in all womanly subjects the pictures on the walls the books on the tables books fresh from the library memoirs letters travels philosophy books that indicate the superior mind in her tour of the rooms with daisy after dinner she ignored only one somewhat conspicuous object lady mary's embroidery frame where a solitary poplar showed amid a desert of tissue paper sir michael revealed himself to lady mary's anxious gaze as a person of sufficiently dignified aspect he was considerably over six feet very thin and very upright a hard man with narrow steel-grey eyes iron-grey hair cropped close and a heavy moustache and beetling brows that were almost black lady mary suspected a cruel mouth under that drooping moustache had miss thelliston behaved badly lady mary might have waited still hoping that the danger would blow over but seeing the girl's manners irreproachable she felt that there was no time to be lost such a love affair was like a quicksand and conrad was sinking so fast that he would soon be submerged beyond the hope of rescue whatever her power might be she must use it at once she invited irene to her sofa with a smile when the girl had made the round of the pictures and had said all that could be said about them please sit by my side for a few minutes miss thelliston i want to ask you something the delicate colour on the girl's cheek faded ever so slightly and her eyes grew grave oh i hope you are not going to be serious she said in a very low voice pray let bygones be bygones i must be serious i am not going to speak of the past at least not more than is absolutely necessary but i must speak to you about the future will you come to see me after your ride to-morrow morning so that we may have half an hour's quiet talk together will you come to breakfast at half-past nine no i won't break bread with you if you are going to talk seriously i know what that means i won't sit at a table with you and miss meredith and your son and pretend to be happy if i have that on my mind i'll come here at eleven o'clock if you like i am my own mistress till luncheon lady thelliston requires the morning for her complexion then i shall expect you at eleven be assured i am not going to say anything unkind i hope not lady mary i have had my fill of unkindness she rose and went over to the piano where daisy was going to sing with captain mansfeld who was one of those young men who do things singing amateur acting lightning portraits tricks with billiard balls and a little conjuring professor wilmer the man of letters walked to the other end of the room in disgust in a friendly party of eight he ought to have been the star and a monologue from him should have been the only entertainment and here were an amateur tenor and contralto blocking conversation and spoiling his evening the little dresden clock on the mantelshelf in lady mary's morning-room struck eleven with a tiny silvery chime the clock on the stairs solemnly repeated the information and a church clock ever so far away sent the same message through the summer air while lady mary moved about the room restlessly nervous and apprehensive would the girl keep her appointment she had only three minutes uncertainty before the butler announced miss thelliston irene was dressed simply and girlishly in a white frock and white hat with white gloves and sunshade a small bunch of pink carnations at her waistband was the only touch of colour her clothes would have been simple enough for a village in the heart of the country but the general effect was distinguished and her morning face was exquisite her cheeks flushed with vivid rose and her eyes brilliant as it was some great joy it was not the countenance that lady mary expected to see here there was no touch of shame or of remorse yet there was no defiance only unmeasurable content will you sit here by the window we can talk quite at our ease daisy meredith has gone for a walk with the dogs i want to talk to you seriously straight from my heart to your heart they were seated side by side on a large low sofa that filled lady mary's favourite bow window a window commanding a peep into park lane and the trees in hamilton gardens there was a silence of some moments and then mary harling said gravely i dare say you know that my son admires you miss thelliston yes i know as much as that it is only natural that he should admire a very beautiful girl about whose antecedents he knows nothing 
but i think your own good feeling your own good taste will induce you to do all in your power to discourage him but why lady mary need you ask me why he is my son my only son dearer to me than life can't you understand that it would break my heart if he were to marry any woman whose girlhood there was a stain no i can't understand have you forgotten your own words that last night on board the electra some day you said a good man might want me for his wife and you urged me to tell him my wretched story and you told me that if he was indeed my true lover he would forgive me and take me to his heart and cherish me for the rest of my days that is what you told me lady mary so now i suppose you wish me to tell your son the story of my life in cashmere no no i want you to act like a true and generous woman and to let my son go his fancy has been caught by your beauty there can be no depth or seriousness in his feeling for you all you have to do is to let him see that you are not attracted to him that he is nothing to you it must be so easy for you to give up this one admirer since you are lovely enough to have many suitors men of high rank in the world men who can give you a position that every other woman will envy you are very kind to promise me such grand things but i do not happen to care for them your son loves me with a most enchanting love and i would rather be his wife than a duchess if there were a duke in my horoscope oh but you must not marry him you must not i won't live to see you married to my son lady mary cried vehemently losing all self-control what will you do to prevent it everything was settled this morning and i am engaged to your son my father rode alone for with this interview hanging over me i did not care for the row conrad joined my father there and told him that he wanted to marry me and my father brought him home to breakfast and after breakfast he followed me to the drawing-room oh he is splendid noble generous a king among men i don't wonder you are proud of him we were talking for a long time heart to heart and i promised to be his wife and we were both as happy as mortal creatures can be are you going to try to part us will you break the oath you swore upon your crucifix you a good christian will you tell him my story no i can do nothing it is you who must act you have known him less than a month you can't really love him juliet had not known romeo half a dozen hours juliet juliet had not surrendered herself to a profligate had not borne a profligate's child juliet was not a precocious sinner i won't have you for my son's wife do you hear irene thelliston if i am tongue-tied it is you who must disillusionize him you must do everything that tact and cleverness can do to cure him of his infatuation without breaking his heart that is what you have to do and i am to marry any man i can catch the highest in the land so long as i don't marry your son you are not to marry my son he has been deceived once cruelly deceived by a girl he thought pure as snow he has suffered he shall not be deceived a second time i will do anything anything to save him from you will you break your oath i don't know i might be justified even in doing that to save my son from dishonour you think your secret is safely hidden but i tell you no secret can be kept for ever least of all the secret of a woman's shame some witness will rise up against you the servant who brought you from india your child or the people who have the care of your child my child only lived a few hours i had been too unhappy to bring a new life into the world my maid is in australia she is an honourable woman after her lights and she swore never to betray me she will not break her oath and your stepmother does not she know no one knows but my father that's why we hate each other horrible yes it is horrible i never look at him without shuddering at the thought of his contempt in the midst of new friends who are kind enough to make much of me i look across the crowd and see his hard face the face that has never looked at me kindly since i so sorely wanted a father's kindness he who has such need of pardon for his sins against my mother cannot forgive me i am a woman and there is no pardon for a woman's sin 
your stepmother seems kind to you yes she is kind and i accept her kindness there are compromises i live under the same roof with her though she helped to break my mother's heart i don't mean that she was my father's mistress i should draw the line at that but i know that she flirted with him and kept him dangling about her when all his time and care ought to have been given to his dying wife you must be very unhappy in such a home we don't say too much about home my father and his wife have made me understand that i am expected to marry before the end of the season she buys me nice clothes and he has given me her horse for the park the clothes and the horse are to get me a husband even that slip of a house is more than my father can comfortably afford he would be better off in ireland i am to marry and to marry well he is enchanted with your son's offer your father is a man of the world does he think your cashmere escapade will never come to light lady mary's irritation had got the better of her womanly feeling for the moment she was merciless yes i have no doubt my father believes as i do that fate will not be so cruel as to hurt me any more and your lover the wretch who seduced and deserted you is he dead i have never heard of his death suppose you were to meet him by and by as the wife of a man of position don't you think that would be rather awkward for you and for your husband i think not he showed himself a man of the world when he went away and made no sign if we were to meet he would show himself a man of the world again i have no fear that he would betray me or that he would make love to you and how about your own feelings you must have loved him desperately when when you let him spoil your life you have no right to talk to me like that cried the girl with sudden vehemence what do you know of such tragedies you with your smooth existence hedged round with conventionalities guarded on every side you who could hardly have gone wrong if you had been the most vicious of women what do you know about me when i let him spoil my life you say when i let him i was seventeen and i had been educated by the proper people who never hint that life has dangers when i let him i was in the power of a profligate intoxicated with sweet words with flattered vanity told for the first time that i was beautiful and that i was beloved what did i know of love but the sweetness of it the love i had read about in romeo and juliet the love he read of the love of haiti for juan oh so overpoweringly sweet in the ears of ignorance you don't know you can never 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 understand yes i think i can i am sorry for you i blame your seducer and the woman who left you in his power the wicked woman who had the fate of a girl in her keeping and took no care i have always been sorry for you but i will not let my son marry you but you promised me a husband some good man who would hear my confession and pity me and take me to his heart what kind of a man was he to be a village schoolmaster perhaps or a curate a shopkeeper's son who had won a scholarship and got himself ordained some one second class you shall not marry my son how will you hinder me by every means in my power and you may be sure a mother's intelligence will find the way though i may not see it now you shall not marry him i could tell you something about him that would scare you perhaps and make you glad to give him up you would tell me that seven years of his young life were wasted in a madhouse do you think that would frighten me how did you know he told me this morning before he asked me to be his wife perhaps even you don't know how noble he is how frank and chivalrous and true a king among men and can you think that i will give him up i have suffered by a man's wickedness i have drained the cup of sorrow and shame i live with a father i hate and a stepmother i despise and when a good man comes to me and offers me a love that leapt into life the night we met strangers in one hour lovers in the next do you think i am going to let my true love go if you have any sense of honour you cannot marry him but i might marry the other man the curate or the schoolmaster remember what you said to me i had only to tell him my story if the worst comes to the worst i can tell conrad and do you think he would forgive you i am sure he would 
i should make him very miserable it would be a cruel thing to do it would take the bloom off our love and our happiness but he would not send me away i have grown into his heart he could not do without me she had calmed herself after her burst of passion and her face grew radiant as she spoke of her lover she paused before the mantelpiece for a moment or two while she adjusted her hat and smiled at the brilliant reflection he loves me lady mary and i can make him happy she said you had better be kind let the dead bury their dead just take time and think things over quietly she moved towards the door while lady mary stood with an adamantine countenance and forgot even to ring the bell she held out her hand at parting but lady mary would not take it halfway downstairs she met conrad who caught her in his arms surprised and rapturous my angel you have been with my mother you have told her i was just going to her how sweet of you she ought to be delighted she is hardly that as yet it is so sudden so dreadfully quick for a mother but she will be pleased by and by when she knows me better i am going to make you happy conrad oh so happy she let her head sink upon his breast half swooning in the sudden reaction from the scene above stairs and he smothered her face with kisses and had no memory of a face almost as lovely that had nestled there and been kissed as fondly by a passionate lad of twenty eight years ago when does the new love remember the old they had the spacious landing all to themselves just long enough for this little love scene in the shelter of tall palms and the cool light filtered through venetian shutters and then an electric bell rang sharply the servants were on the alert in the hall below and conrad had to behave with circumspection as he escorted his sweetheart to the door and went out with her that she should walk alone to chapel street that radiant creature whose dazzling beauty challenged every eye would have been out of the question he went with her and they made a detour by park lane and green street and they talked as only newly plighted lovers can of a future of ineffable bliss End of chapter seven chapter eight part one of dead love has chains by mary elizabeth braddon this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight part one mary harling was beaten she had the ever-present memory of what the doctors had said to her the grave warning of peril and with the revelation of her son's impassioned temperament which every day was brought more vividly before her mind she could hardly question the medical verdict this fine brain was too nearly allied with the heart to stand the shock of an unhappy love the same kind of trouble that had been fatal to him in his twentieth year might again be fatal since in every characteristic in every feeling and impulse he seemed no older at eight-and-twenty than he had been as an undergraduate it might be that those years at roehampton counted for nothing and that he was still in the dawn of manhood eager and impetuous seeking the blue flower of joy with a fervour that would not brook disappointment lady mary felt that her armoury was exhausted she had used her strongest weapons and her sword had bent in her hand her gun had missed fire the girl had met threats and entreaties with the same indomitable spirit the girl meant to marry her son no hope remained but in machiavellian tactics and lady mary felt that she must take things quietly and exert her utmost power of machiavellianism conrad's light foot came bounding up the stair while she sat before her writing-table disconsolate just as she had sunk down when the girl left her he dashed into the room bringing the breath of summer and youth and happiness with him my dear dear mother she has told you she came herself to tell you could anything be sweeter of course she must adore you she who has no real mother you are not going to lose a son you are going to gain a daughter he was on his knees by her chair he had seized her cold hand and was kissing it in a fever of filial love dear mother tell me you are pleased and what a struggle it cost the wan smile the low murmur i must be content if my dear son is happy and would you not have chosen her is she not all you would have chosen i have no choice i have never thought of choosing i only wanted my dearest to be happy and i am going to be happy divinely happy i feel as if this earth i tread on has been changed to an olympian cloud i walk on air 
i am breathless in a rarefied atmosphere think what it is to me mother to find this pure and perfect pearl after the disillusion of my youth when my goddess my angel the creature i almost worshipped was shown to me in a moment without a note of warning as the most worthless of her sex a hypocrite and a liar a prize-fighter's light of love can you wonder that my mind gave way under the shock there was a silence while conrad still knelt his mother's head bent over him her arms about his neck oh the agony of it to know that he was again deceived that this new angel who brought him ineffable bliss was a mock angel and that at any moment the mask might drop and he might know himself again the dupe of second-hand charms to know this and to be unable to undeceive him constrained to silence by so dreadful a fear her oath might perhaps have been as nothing to her the sin of perjury might have lain lightly on her conscience had it been for his interest to tell him the cruel truth but she could not speak words that would crush him in the dawn of joy at the risk of a shattered mind and a life ruined for ever better that he should be happy in his own way perhaps never to be undeceived it might be as the girl said that no witness would ever rise up against her and it might be that she loved conrad as he deserved to be loved she who had so suffered might love better than the sinless and the untried her affection ought to be so much the stronger for her gratitude to him who taught her the divinity of a good man's love mother you are crying is that the way you welcome joyful news my dearest there are always two sides to a question i want you to be happy but we have been all the world to each other you and i you must allow something for a mother's jealousy and then i have been thinking of daisy poor daisy why poor daisy and irene will be capital friends we shall take daisy about with us on the motor daisy will have a good time doing gooseberry will it be a good time do you think to be a third and rather in the way after the long rides with you in hampshire the croquet the billiards the time when you devoted yourself to her all day long so that i almost thought you almost thought i was falling in love with her and i thought so too ma'am and one day one heavenly may morning when the world seemed enchanted i was on the brink of a proposal we had ridden to the edge of the forest we were in that lonely wood you know in the valley beyond ringwood and i felt like a man under a spell i was almost drunk with the rapture of life in that green woodland under that azure sky and daisy seemed the spirit of the wood a most enchanting hamadryad in a neat little riding habit i was nearly gone when i remembered that au fond my feelings were simply cousinly or even brotherly and that no doubt daisy had just the same temperate affection for me i am not so sure of that conrad i am afraid your kindness in those happy days at cranford may have turned her head a little she is very sensitive and she is six-and-twenty heads don't spin round easily at that age and it is only a mother who believes that every girl in the world must find her son irresistible daisy and i are comrades and friends and always will be if she takes to irene as i feel sure she will my dearest and again there were signs of tears oh mother why this dolefulness is not my love a lady the daughter of a man who has fought for his country and won his sovereign's recognition is not my love fair too fair too fair oh conrad can't you understand that i am fearful of a love that is founded only upon beauty it fills me with fear when i see my son the slave of a lovely face what do you know of miss thelliston except that she is beautiful your father and i had known each other for more than a year before he asked me to marry him i knew all about him his conduct his opinions his religion i knew that i was giving myself to a man who would never disappoint me who would be husband friend counsellor all the world to me as he was till death took him the rush of tears that came after those words seemed natural and conrad was not offended dearest of mothers yours was an ideal courtship in the old-fashioned jog-trot way but i belong to a swifter moving generation and i yearn for the poetry of life remember how your favourite shakespeare said he never loved that love not at first sight i have no doubt that my father was in love with you all that year of your acquaintance though he was not so impetuous as i am come now ma'am let us all be happy open your heart to my sweet love and every day will make you fonder of her by the by 
why didn't you ask her to come back to luncheon she wouldn't come for my asking i didn't think of it oh but you must make her welcome ma'am you must make her feel that she belongs to us and that she is not to stand upon punctilio i don't i told her to tell lady thelliston that i was going to lunch with them and by joe it's twenty minutes past one and they lunch at half past conrad got up shook himself like a dog in good spirits and was at the door when his mother asked are you going anywhere this afternoon to richmond on the mercedes tell daisy to be ready at a quarter to four we shall have tea at the star will you drive down and join us no dear it's too far we shall be back in time for a stroll in the park i shall expect to find you there he was gone gone to the new love and the new life come what might no word nor act of hers must bring about the ruin of his hopes henceforward conrad's courtship went on velvet everybody seemed to rejoice in the joy of these young lovers since the two persons to whom that sudden betrothal brought pain instead of joy had to smooth their brows and to hide a stricken heart with a smile it was only when conrad told daisy meredith of his engagement and entreated her warmest regard for his future wife that she knew how dear he had become to her or the dream she had cherished that she had become dear to him conrad had been so kind so cruelly so fatally kind in those glad days at cranford he had seemed so completely content with life in her society while every day had brought them some new discovery of mutual tastes opinions sympathies from trivial things the love of a dog a horse a flower or some particular phase in the sky the earth the atmosphere to the highest the deeply felt need of a personal god the anxious belief in their hereafter in a moment that dream had vanished he might still be her friend in telling her of his new happiness he had dwelt upon his affection for her had urged her to be to his wife as a sister but he could never more be as he had been in that golden maytime the blossoming season of her life the season in which life had been more than life and earth had ceased to be earthly not for worlds would she have appeared disappointed or forlorn she had that fine feminine pluck which can look upon the funeral pyre of love and smile she played her poor little part of gooseberry with grace and vivacity she was never in the way and never out of the way when wanted she suffered the rush and noise of the mercedes the dust of the roads the monotony of afternoon teas that whether at richmond or esher or wimbledon or windsor were always the image of each other she talked when she was wanted to talk and was always absorbed in the landscape when the lovers began to whisper confidences those mysterious confidences which engaged young men and maidens have to impart to each other she did all that the situation demanded with a face that beamed with intelligence and a heart heavier than lead the shabby house at holloway the bickering parents the slovenly parlour-maid would have seemed a haven of peace but she was too proud to fly some one might get an inkling of her secret if she were to show the faintest distaste for her sickening office happily for her there was a limit to her martyrdom for the wedding was to take place in august sir michael and his future son-in-law being of one opinion as to the needlessness of delay while irene had consented readily to an early marriage if we were to be engaged for years i could not trust you more than i do now she told her lover i know how good you are i know how happy we are going to be that was a song she sang to him in all those joyous days they were going to be happy she was going to make him happy it was the string she harped upon on love's mystical lyre material arrangements are easy when the suitor has thirty thousand a year lady mary insisted upon giving up cranford but she would of course retain the house in hertford street which was hers for life conrad and irene had the joy of house hunting among their other pleasures and house hunting when rent is no object is as joyous a business as it is weary and wearing for small purses even in this daisy had to assist scaling four-story staircases in hill street and charles street and green street and norfolk street till after days of exploration a small house was discovered in park lane which was the situation irene had desired from the first after the discovery of the ideal house there came consultations and fierce discussions with the ideal architect that is to say the architect at the top of the mode that season who was something of an autocrat and wanted his own way about every detail 
so that at last conrad had to remind him that it was he and his wife who would have to live in the house and that however perfect it might be as a work of art it would be hard lines if they did not like it when however this famous artist sent in drawings of the house as it was to be after he had worked his will upon it the blue windows and the pale pink walls and delicate touches of water-colour had such a ruskinesque effect that irene was all for letting the architect have a free hand and finally it was agreed that he should alter and bedouble the house until nothing but the mere shell of the original structure would remain that which had been kitchen becoming wine-cellar and servants bedrooms being transformed into kitchens all inner walls on the first and second floor being removed leaving vast spaces where there had been small rooms and ceilings supported by steel girders and a pilaster or two daisy told lady mary that she liked the original telescopic drawing-rooms better the positive comparative and superlative expanding from a boudoir not much bigger than a powder closet at the back of the house through a smallish middle room to a somewhat spacious drawing-room with three french windows opening on a balcony the early victorian balcony was to disappear and the three windows were to become one stone mullioned medieval with a deep window-seat and leaded casements to let in the rain there was to be nothing more recent than the period of francis i and diane de poitiers this transmogrification would take time and the house would not be ready till next season sir michael and lady thelliston went to hampshire in the panhard with the lovers to see the place which was to be their daughter's country home and all things were admired and approved irene had not daisy's way of looking at horses and dogs nor did she walk straight into the hearts of the irish setters as daisy had done but she admired the fine old quadrangle of red brick and stone where stables and saddle rooms and coach-houses and grooms quarters were dignified by the spaciousness of the enclosure and the stone basin round which the pigeons clustered where there had been a fountain that had not played within the memory of man she admired the large rooms the broke oak balusters and carved newels of the staircase the grandeur and spaciousness everywhere is this really to be my house she said with a glad little laugh that conrad thought enchanting they lunched in the large dining-room where the round table looked like an island in an ocean of turkey carpet they were a cosy party of four daisy not being required on this occasion and it mattered nothing to conrad that his future father-in-law had a cold cruel face or that his future mother-in-law's complexion was a curious and instructive spectacle in the clear light of a july noontide conrad knew nothing he cared for nothing save the girl by whose side he was sitting and whose slender grace as she moved about the rooms that were to be her own had enthralled him they had roamed over the house hand in hand exploring rooms and corridors looking at family portraits from lawrence to buckner the first harling of any importance having been painted by the former master ours isn't a long pedigree conrad said laughing we only date from sir thomas lawrence ah but on your mother's side oh the duke's family tree begins with king stephen's armour-bearer and the family is as rusty as the armour that hangs in the castle wall irene was enthusiastic about the billiard-room and library with the door of communication i shall sit here and read after dinner while you and your friends play she said looking at the shelves where every book she had ever heard of or desired seemed to be waiting for her books having been one of mr harling's vanities exquisite books and exquisite bindings the trousseau was a business that occupied many mornings sir michael being too much a man of the world to hold his hand when his daughter was marrying thirty thousand a year and when her settlement was to be exceptionally generous nothing asked from the bride's people and everything given irene herself showed indifference about her wedding clothes rare in any young woman rarer perhaps in an old woman she allowed her stepmother and the dressmaker to choose and settle everything only stipulating that most of her frocks should be white and that her trousseau should be planned with a view to foreign travel rather than to display at home we shall be wandering about the world till next season she told madame hermini and i shall go to any queer wild places my husband wants to see so you must give me no useless finery but when the suave and expensive hermini heard of winter in egypt she protested that madame would want more evening frocks and smarter evening coats than if she were staying in london irene shrugged her shoulders disdainfully i am not going to parties at huge hotels she said i am going to live in a felucca or under canvas with my husband my husband the word charmed her she had never dreamed of this joyous love never hoped to be so honoured and so cherished 
she who had suffered the dull despair of a young life that has no fair outlook fate had been good to her after all only one thing troubled conrad in this joyous time and that was a certain want of cordiality between his mother and the girl of his heart in vulgar parlance these two whom he loved best in the world did not take to each other lady mary was courteous and irene was unfailing in all proper marks of respect for the lady's age and position but there were no signs of growing intimacy still less of affection i thought you would be so fond of my mother he said one day with almost a note of reproach i shall be fond of her when she is fond of me irene answered but that has to come perhaps when we have been married a year or two and i have made you happy the ice will melt women are inscrutable i made sure that you would love each other she never had a daughter and you who loved your mother so dearly 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 don't speak of her don't make me think of her in her last days upon this earth when i counted every breath she drew hung upon every word faint words at long intervals and when i knew that each word might be the last he caught her to his heart he kissed away her tears never never would he again invoke a memory that grieved her my mother will adore you by and by he said and then in a lower voice he asked can you guess when she will love you best he whispered the answer to his own question when our first-born child is laid in her arms irene's head drooped lower on his breast and the lips that were hidden from him were mute she clung to him in silence and he felt the hurried beating of her heart and knew he had distressed her but could not understand why conrad never spoke to her again about her relations with his mother comforting himself with the assurance that intimacy and affection would come in good time irene had spoken words of wisdom his mother would love the woman who gave happiness to her son perhaps such close relations must always begin with a little aversion or at least with some distrust after her terrible interview with lady mary irene had resolved never to bend her neck before a woman who had so outraged her pride of womanhood whatever love or kindness was to come in the future should come unsought she would never plead in forma pauperis never take the lower ground of acknowledged guilt strong in conrad's love she would defy the world she had brought her father to her feet after years of unkindness he fawned upon her he praised and admired her and made believe that no cloud had ever crossed her sky he even talked freely before conrad of her life in ireland hidden in a rustic village with an aunt who worshipped her nobody had ever told him of any such worship the idea was spontaneous lady mary wondered at the girl's calm front and perhaps in her heart of hearts admired her for being so quietly defiant so self-assured and resolute the calmness under deeply agitating conditions indicated good blood was indeed as much a sign and token of race as her small feet and delicate hands and all those other marks of refinement in her beautiful person a girl of mean birth would have trembled and cringed and so the summer days went by fleet and sweet as summer days can be when people are ineffably happy the lovers were rarely parted between early morning in the row and the small hours after a ball except in the inevitable time which the least vain of young women must sacrifice to the exigencies of london clothes first came the morning ride and after breakfast a walk or shopping and then luncheon in chapel street or perhaps one of lady mary's luncheon parties which she could not desist from giving all at once she had indeed to do more entertaining now that her son was engaged to be married in the afternoons there were long jaunts in one of the motors and on opera nights there was an early dinner in hertford street and an evening in lady mary's capacious box and there were occasional dinner parties and dances almost every night dances to which the pretty miss thelliston was always bidden dances with chaperones and friendly little dances without chaperones so that scarcely a night passed in that enchanting july when conrad's arms were not encircling his betrothed in the waltz they both loved and in which they both excelled then there were the suburban races sandown and kempton to which conrad carried irene and his cousin with some agreeable youth or middle-aged swain to make a fourth and amuse daisy captain mansfeld was the favourite as he was keen on racing and knew the lineage and previous performances of every horse and the merits and peculiarities of every jockey 
it was one saturday afternoon at sandown under tropical sunshine in the mob of overpowering frocks and hats and more or less attractive faces that they met a man who had achieved a momentary distinction by the purchase of a famous derby winner and by the success of one of his own horses at the newmarket first spring meeting he had a horse running at sandown this afternoon and had that peculiar air of suppressed agitation common to owners when their luck trembles in the balance and in this condition with eyes brightened as with fever and a certain over alertness of movement and manner he ran against captain mansfeld who was walking with daisy meredith while conrad and irene sauntered after them it was still early in the afternoon and the most important race was yet to come the man had a loud voice resonant and not unmelodious and they could hear every word as they approached it was all about his horse and the chances for and against he was a large man tall and broad-shouldered handsome commanding of aspect a man who looked as if he had once been a soldier well set up still but a little out of training idleness and high living had set their mark upon the magnificent figure and the face was one upon which high thinking had never been expressed it was perfect from the sculptor's point of view but the beauty was purely physical the type suggestive of the arena and not of the forum come round and look at horoscope before they saddle him if miss meredith is fond of horses she'll appreciate his good looks he was saying having in a manner forced mansfeld to introduce him to the young lady and then as conrad and his sweetheart approached he turned and met them face to face he looked at irene with a surprise that was instantaneous and then with an expectant look that obliged her to recognize him she bowed ever so slightly and walked on quickening her pace with her large white sunshade lowered a little so that her face was hidden do you know that man asked conrad with a lover's jealous distrust of any stranger who presumes to claim acquaintance with the beloved i met him years ago in india is he a friend of sir michael's no i don't think my father knows him but you met him it was in cashmere he was a friend of my cousin's was he in the army yes he was in the grenadiers but he had left the army and was travelling for his amusement wouldn't have him in the guards perhaps he doesn't look their sort what is the matter with him something indefinite something i don't want to put into plain words some men are born so men whose blood is of the deepest blue and whose ancestors were fine gentlemen in the first crusade you condemn him on rather slight evidence never having even talked to him i heard him talk just now bragging about his horse wanting my cousin to go and look at the brute out of his own mouth he has condemned himself i'm sorry your cousin had to suffer the burden of his acquaintance there had been no change in irene's voice or manner as she talked of the man not the faintest sign of fear or distress yet this chance meeting was one of the dark moments of life she felt the hand of fate upon her she had hugged herself with the assurance that she would never see that face again never hear again the voice that had once charmed her to-day she saw him as conrad saw him with a deep disgust handsome yes splendid as common clay unillumined by soul can be an earth man in whom there was no sign of the immortal mind she wondered if he had changed utterly from the man she had once loved the man to whom she gave her childish admiration her childish trust the man who had pursued her with a passionate insistence from the hour when her eyes first looked up at him with a schoolgirl's innocent admiration of a magnificent being the typical guardsman of the romantic novel she had been able to control voice and manner but she could not command her colour and presently when they were sitting at tea and she could no longer shelter herself under her parasol conrad exclaimed at her pallor she had been walking in the sun it was his fault he was as much distressed as if he had taken her unawares through a plague-stricken city he was sure that her head ached that she was almost fainting all her protestations to the contrary were useless he looked appealingly at daisy what had better to be done should they go home directly after tea perhaps he could find a doctor who would prescribe something he could run to a chemist at escher to get a prescription made up he looked as troubled as if death were in the air irene protested that she had no headache please let us sit quietly somewhere out of the sun that is all i want perhaps daisy will sit with me in some shady corner while you and captain mansfeld look at the race as if i should leave you cried conrad reproachfully i give you my word i am not going to die 
said Irene, with a silvery laugh that was reassuring. He told Mansfeld and Daisy to go and amuse themselves, and to be at the gate ready for the drive home at a quarter to seven, and then he went off with Irene, away from the race-course and the crowd, to stroll on Escher Common. It was Irene who suggested the common. "'It will be a relief to be away from all those frocks and hats,' she said, "'if you don't mind not seeing the race.' "'As if I should mind, as if I wanted to see anything in the world except your face.' when that looks pale and wan my world collapses you gave me a scare just now irene but a little pick of pink has come back just the ghost of your morning colour when we meet in the park and i say to myself here comes my rose of june End of chapter eight part one